divine form of God and pray for the well-being of the whole humanity. Shanti Hari Om Tat Sat Om Stapakaya Chadharmasya Sarvadharmaswarupine Stapakaya Chadharmasya Sarvadharmaswarupine Avatar Varishtaya Rama Krishna Yate Nama Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyote Gamaya Mrityorma Mrityangamaya Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Let us bow down to Sri Ramakrishna, the embodiment of all religions, the Supreme God incarnate. Let us pray to Him to lead us from the unreal to the real, to lead us from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge, to lead us from death to immortality. We have been discussing since last two classes three ways of karma yoga. One is uh, doing work for work's sake and doing work as worship and the third one is doing work with detachment. The whole theme is to spiritualize our daily activity. That is the purpose of Karma Yoga. You should not get lost into the way how people involve themselves without any philosophical background, pulled by tremendous desires, how they continuously keep suffering on account of such type of work. But if you know the technique of doing the work, even though you are in the world and doing the activities, still you can manage yourself as if you are not tainted by doing the work. That's the point which we should remember. Herein comes the teachings of the spiritual masters, how one should conduct oneself in this world. So spiritualizing the activity leads to the realization of the truth. Whether a person believes in the personal God or whether he believes God at all, but what is needed to be Believe it is that one should aspire for the truth. You may call the truth by any name you want to. But truth should be realized. Why should we realize the truth? In order to be free from never-ending sufferings and miseries in this world. And in order to put a stop to for coming back and forth into this world, passing through all sorts of uh, pains. So, if you realize the truth, 
then you are released from all these sufferings. Not only that, because of your realization of the truth, you enjoy the world really than the people who are uh, trying to enjoy the world in a materialistic way. Well, the idea is whatever work you do, do it as if you are playing. So the playful attitude, knowing that means your mind should be always diverted to towards the truth and you are focusing your attention on that. But by the by you are playing, working in whatever way you are working in this world. Just as uh, the elderly person or a father. I have seen uh, in some families how the parents keep playing with the children and they laugh and they they make all gestures they pose themselves to be defeated by the children's play just to make the children enjoy more fun but the parents know that they are just playing in order to make the children happy so the same attitude we must have when we have to work in this world. It is just a play, nothing but play. If you are well established in this fact, then you are nearer to the experience of enjoying real peace. Well, we have discussed the two aspects of Karma Yoga, the two ways of Karma Yoga. In the first way, where work is done for work's sake, willpower and concentration of mind are very important. In the case of doing work as worship, tremendous devotion and dedication, surrendering oneself totally to the Divine, they are important. So he feels immensely joyful in surrendering himself totally, not owning anything for himself, not expecting any award or reward. He is not bothered about them. Whether they come or go, he is not even aware of them. Just do work for the love of God. So by doing the work, thinking it is Lord's work he is doing, in that attitude he uplifts himself and in that upliftment he feels tremendous joy. He feels totally relieved because he thinks that there is divine power who is taking all the burden. So, in a way he is practicing belief and faith that God takes all the responsibility and he is just a servant just doing the work of the Lord. The attitude of servant is that he wants to be free from ego which is most terrible obstruction in one's spiritual progress. So in order to get rid of this uh, dangerous uh, ego, the only way or the easiest way is to assume oneself as a servant of God. In that attitude, you won't feel the ego sense at all. Once you have surrendered everything to God, where is the question of your ego coming there again? Well, that's also a wonderful way of performing the work. What I mean to say is, you must have perfect, proper attitude. Attitude is important when you are doing the work. 
That will take you towards the truth. The third kind of karma yoga which I am going to talk to you today is that work with detachment. Work with detachment. Is it possible to do that? Because always we are influenced by some kind of link more so with some kind of attachment, some kind of attraction and fascination comes in the way of our doing the work. But in order to spiritualize the work, it is taught that one should develop the attitude of detachment. And this type of doing work with detachment appeals to the temperament of a jnani, that is, a man who is following the path of knowledge, who is influenced by the Advaita Vedanta, the absolute reality. He wants to practice right knowledge here and now. Hence he takes to Karma Yoga, not as a servant of God, but with the predominant of work with detachment. This approach can be understood from the fact that Advaita teaches the separateness and aloofness of the inner soul from all activity. Work with detachment aligns very well with Jnana Yoga. Whatever yoga one practices, everyone in one way or other is performing the work. But if you cherish this spiritual attitude while doing the work, it helps you in your sadhana. According to the path of knowledge, it is very clearly stated, the purusha, the self of a person, is absolutely different from prakriti or phenomenal nature. Yet it is a fundamental tragedy of man that he has forgotten his true self and become identified with the natural objects. These objects include not only material possessions in the ordinary sense of the term, but the body and mind as well. Suppose you consider the condition of an avid movie goer. He is very fond of seeing the movies. He can't stay on without going to movie. He has to go every day and must spend his time. Once he is inside the theatre, he quickly falls under the fascination of the light show before him. He is totally drawn towards the show. That means he is unconsciously drawn into the film's drama. Thereby he loses his individuality as it were. He identifies with characters on the screen, empathizes with their joy and sorrow and rises and falls with their success and failure. In fact, it is well known some of the people looking into the scenes in the theatre, some even they weep and some people even they shout just by seeing the play in the theatre. That means they give, uh, they express a reaction 
that means they they are actively participating in what they are seeing in the film so he has lost his own self consciousness and hence he shares the fate of the character with whom he identifies the situation of the ordinary person is exactly the same he forgets his own true nature the pure actionless witness consciousness and identifies with the play of the body and mind under the false premise that he is a psycho physical being he extends his self identity ever further outward to embrace the sense objects of the external world so this is the way we have seen ordinarily how people are influenced now let us consider a person a great sage who has established himself well in the reality that means who abides in his true self and remains at one with the conscious principle how does he live how does he work in the world it is very amazing to see such people and it gives tremendous inspiration to see how these great sages perform work such a sage identifies himself with the spirit and knows that he is not really the doer that it is prakriti that works all changes he is not attaching himself to whatever is done through his senses or his uh, nature because he is disidentified with the body and mind he remains balanced in pleasure and pain loss and gain sometimes the disease comes the body suffers but he maintains the attitude of witness sakshi bhava in that attitude he disidentifies himself with whatever the uh, reactions going on in the system in general the sage is calm he is collected and serene his natural tendency is to remain quiet and simply abide in the self when he does undertake some form of activity he does so as the detached witness the fundamental problem of man is one of self forgetfulness self forgetfulness means suffering self remembrance on the other hand awakens divine joy and bestows spiritual freedom the most effective means of keeping a constant recall of the higher self the detached witness of all action is through the practice of affirmation to the extent that i can affirm my own true self and retain the conviction that i am the self i will be able to remain detached even in the midst of pricky patch of karma a person can devise his own statements of affirmation or he can collect strong scriptural passages that tells this idea the essential practice is to keep aware of one's true nature and not allow contrary thoughts to arise there was a famous uh, sage in south india we have got some of his uh, teachings books in our bookstore ramana maharshi the sage of uh, tiruvannamalai who got illumination and who was source of inspiration to all the people who would come to him once he said a brahmin may play various parts in a drama yet the thought that he is a brahmin does not leave his mind similarly 
when one is engaged in various empirical acts, there should be the firm conviction, I am the self, without allowing the false idea, I am the body, to arise. You must be always aware, I am the self, separate from this body, separate from this mind. If the mind should stray away from its state, then immediately one should inquire, Oh, we are not the body and mind, who are we? We are the self. Thus one should establish the mind in that pure state. At first, an affirmation of detachment may appear to be mere words and purely an intellectual exercise, but it calls forth a very definite effective response. It has a dramatic impact on human feelings. Attachment seems to be an emotional bond. It is characterized by, characterized by attraction or aversion for this or that thing. That is, you are constantly under the stress and strain on account of likes and dislikes. One may think, therefore, that mere words will be ineffective in removing it. But feeling and sentiment are only a directive, a derivative function of words, that is, of good thoughts and ideas. By changing our sentences and remodeling our belief systems, the whole pattern of feeling changes as well. In retrospect then, these are the three different methods of spiritualizing everyday life. Each one appeals to a particular psychological type and evokes a definite background ideology. The person who works for work's sake is a non-religious, non-philosophical person who clearly perceives the bond slavery of selfish action and rebels against it. The life's goal of such a person is freedom from the compulsion of desire. His tools of practice are the, are the strength and will and the power of concentration, which I said in the beginning. So he is fed up with the pull of the desires. He is not interested anymore. He is disgusted uh, with desires as such. So, without being pulled or pushed by desires, he carries on work with a strong willpower and concentration. The man who does work as worship is primarily a devotee. His life's goal is to render selfless service to his chosen ideal, to grow in divine love through self-sacrifice. His main concern in all activities is the cultivation of uh, spirit, uh, spirit of dedication through afferatory prayer. The jnani is a third type. His goal is self-knowledge and his primary discipline is to break all attachments and remain as a witness of actions. His most useful means of Retaining self-knowledge is the affirmation of detachment. He is always aware of this fact. He is the witness. So, with that attitude, he is able to perform work without being tainted by it. Now, the wise man makes use of all three approaches in his effort to spiritualize everyday life. To limit oneself to one form of karma yoga and dismiss the others as disagreeable is to throw away tools that could expedite, expedite one's progress. The fact is that one passes through differing moods during the course of time. We are not in the same mood all the time. One day the devotional mood may be dominant and work as worship comes easily and yields the best results. And another day, however, 
that mood may change one finds oneself without devotional feelings and sometimes is inclined towards analytical reason on that occasion he need not suspend his sadhana but can assume the role of the gyani and do work with detachment so the three kinds of spiritual work are complementary and mutually supportive optimum growth requires that we incorporate all the methods into our transmission and shift smoothly from one gear to another as a traffic requires see in your car you have got three gears you know first gear second gear third gear it is just like that only then will we come to exemplify the highest ideal of karma yoga everybody has to do karma but if you know the meaningfulness of the karma then you are blessed whatever work you are doing it doesn't bother you on the other hand it takes you towards the goal so you have to maintain that spiritual attitude that's very important without spiritual attitude whatever work you do it just ends up in waste so if you have to derive the benefit out of your actions attitude is extremely important attitude always have that attitude be aware of doing things and of course the the basic foundation for coming to truth is sincerity there should be perfect uh, honesty you must be perfectly sincere so that consciously you are doing things and trying to evolve uplift yourself page 618 m came alone to the garden about 8 o'clock in the evening the great religious festival had already begun lamps had been lighted here and there in the garden and the temples were brightly illuminated music could be heard in the nahabath the temple officers were moving about hurriedly there was to be a theatrical performance in the early hours of the morning the villagers had heard of the festive occasion and a large crowd of men and women young and old was streaming in in the afternoon there had been a musical recital of the chandi by rajana rayan shri ramakrishna had been present with the devotees and had enjoyed the recital immensely as the time for the worship approached he was overwhelmed with ecstasy m found shri ramakrishna seated on the small couch in his room Babu Ram, the younger Gopal, Haripad, Kishori, a relative of Niranjan, a young man from Haryana, and other devotees were seated on the floor facing him. Ram Lal and Hazra were in the room part of the time. Niranjan's young relative was meditating in front of Sri Ram Krishna as the master master had bidden. M saluted the master and took a seat. After a while Niranjan's relative bowed low before Sri Ramakrishna and was about to depart. The young man from Aryada also wished to leave. The master said to Niranjan's relative, "What when will you come again?" The devotee answered, "Perhaps next Monday." Master asked eagerly do you want a lantern to take with you the devotee said no sir i live next to this garden i don't need a lantern master to the young man from aryada he he, he asked him are you going to young man said yes sir i have a slight cold master said all right cover your head then again saluted the master 
and took their leave. It was the awe-inspiring night of the new moon. The worship of the Divine Mother added to its solemnity. Sri Ramakrishna was seated on the couch, leaning against a pillow. His mind was indrawn. Now and then he exchanged a word or two with the devotees. Suddenly he looked at him and the other devotees and said, Oh, how deep the young man's meditation was. To Haripada, he said, Wasn't, wasn't it deep? Haripada said, Yes, sir. He was motionless as a log. Master said to Kishori, Do you know that boy? He is a cousin of Niranjan. Again there was silence in the room. Haripada was gently stroking the master's feet. The master was humming some of the songs he had heard that even during the recital of the Chandi. He sang softly, Who is there that can understand what Mother Kali is? Even the six darshanas are powerless to reveal her. Sri Ramakrishna sat up. With intense fervor he began to sing about the Divine Mother. All creation is the sport of my mad mother Kale. By her maya the three worlds are bewitched. Mad is she and mad is her husband. Mad are her two disciples. None can describe her loveliness, her glories, gestures, moods, Shiva, with the agony of the poison in his throat, chants her name again and again. The personal does she oppose the impersonal. The personal does she oppose to the impersonal, breaking one stone with another. Though to all else she is agreeable, where duties are concerned, she will not yield. Keep your raft, says Ram Prasad, afloat on the sea of life, drifting up with the flood tide, drifting down with the ebb. The master was quite overwhelmed with the song. He said that songs like these denoted a state of divine inebriation. He sang one after another. This time I shall devour thee utterly, Mother Kali, for I was born under an evil star. And one so born becomes, they say, the eater of his mother. Then, O Kali, my mother, full of bliss, enchantress of the almighty Shiva, in thy delirious joy, thou, dan- thou dancest, clapping thy hands together. And then he sang, If for the last my life breath leaves me as I repeat the name of Kali, I shall attain the realm of Shiva. What does Benares mean to me? Infinite are my mother's glories. We, who can find the end of her virtues? Shiva, beholding their smallest part, lies prostrate at her lotus feet. The singing was over. Two sons of Rajnarayan entered the room and bowed low before the master. In the afternoon they had sung with their father the glories of the Divine Mother. The master sang again with them. All creation is the sport of my mad mother Kali. The younger brother requested Sri Ramakrishna to sing a certain song about Sri Gauranga. The master sang Gauranithaya, ye blessed brothers, I have heard how kind you are, and therefore I have come to you. Ram Lal entered the room. The master said to him, Please sing something about the Divine Mother. It is the day of her worship. Ram Lal sang, Who is the woman yonder who lights the field of battle? Darker her body gleams, even than the darkest storm cloud. And from her teeth there flash the lightning's blinding flames. Dishalved, her hair is flying behind as she rushes about, undaunted in this war between the gods and demons. Laughing her terrible laugh, she slays the fleeing Asuras. She'll stop here. Chant the name of the Lord and His glory unceasingly, that mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quench that mighty forest fire, worldly lust, raging furiously within. O name, stream down in moonlight on the lotus heart, opening its cup to knowledge of thyself. O self, drown deep in the waves of his bliss, tasting his nectar at every step, 
bathing in his name that bath for weary souls Various are thy names, O Lord, in each and every name thy power resides. No times are set, no rites are needful for chanting of thy name. She is so vast is thy mercy, how huge then is my wretchedness, who find in this empty life and heart no devotion to thy name. O my mind, be humbler than a blade of grass, be patient and forbearing like a tree. Take no honor to thyself, give honor to all. Chant unceasingly the name of the Lord. O Lord and soul of the universe, mine is no prayer for wealth or retinue. The playthings of lust or the toys of fame. As many times as I may be reborn, grant me, O Lord, a steadfast love for thee. A drowning man in this world's fearful ocean is thy servant, O sweet one. In thy mercy, consider him as dust beneath thy feet. Oh, how I long for the day when in strange separation from thee, O Lord, will be as a thousand years. When my heart burns away with its desire, the world without thee is a heartless void. Prostrate at thy feet, let me be an unwavering devotion, neither imploring the embrace of thine arms, nor bewailing the withdrawal of thy presence, though it was, though it tears my soul asunder. O thou who stillest the hearts of thy devotees, do with me what thou wilt, for thou art my heart's beloved, thou and thou alone. O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness to light, and lead us from death to immortality. May all be free from dangers, may all realize what is good, may all be actuated by noble thoughts, may all rejoice everywhere. May all be happy, may all be free from disease, may all realize what is good, May none be subject to misery. May the wicked become virtuous. May the virtuous attain tranquility. May the tranquil be free from bonds. May the freed make others free. May good be dead all people. May the sovereign righteously rule the earth. May all beings ever attain what is good. May the worlds be prosperous and happy. May the clouds pour in in time. May the earth be blessed with crops. May all countries be free from calamity. May holy men live without fear. May the Lord, the destroyer of sins, the presiding deity of all sacred works, be satisfied. For he being pleased, the whole universe becomes pleased. He being satisfied, the whole universe feels satisfied.